Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the University of Cape Town Graduate School of Business Santon campus. Um, as always, it's great to see so many familiar faces here tonight. Uh, like many of you, I'm an alumnus of the school. I studied there about 10 years ago. Uh, my day job um, is in software, but as Pam mentioned, uh, in my spare time, I volunteer on the school's alumni board and also assist with the GSB Foundation. So if you have any questions about the foundation or the alumni board, please come and chat with me afterwards. Uh, it's my great honor to introduce our first speaker tonight, Professor Crane Sodin. Uh, he's going to be facilitating tonight's discussion. Professor Sodin is the CEO of the Human Sciences Research Council. Many of you know it as the HSRC. Uh, it is the largest dedicated research institution on the African continent. They specialize in humanities and social sciences research. Professor Sodin earned his PhD at the State University of New York and is the current chairperson of the IEB, the Independent Examinations Board. Um, in a past life, he was also the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. So as you can imagine, we are deeply grateful to have you here tonight. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to come and address us. And without further delay, would you please join me in welcoming Professor Sodin. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Kasta. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, uh, I say in anticipation that I'm really delighted to be in the company of these two people here. Um, uh, thanks also to Pamela for facilitating um, the second session of, of David Corton's visit here to South Africa. So I'd like to say a few words about what's brought us here uh, uh, and, and then give you a little bit of a sense of, of of, of David uh, and, 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 and Gavin. So this event comes out of a conversation that um, uh, Dr. Mampella, Rampella initiated um, with uh, myself. Uh, she said, we're bringing the Club of Rome here to South Africa. Do you remember the Club of Rome? Uh, and of course, I, I am old enough to remember. <laughs> Um, so those of you who may not uh, remember, but the Club of Rome is an organization from about the 1970s. Right, David? Yeah. yeah. Um, and they put out a book called Limits to Growth. Uh, and it was a really, uh, for uh, us at university at that time, I was at UCT doing economics. So um, <clears throat> uh, r reading Limits to Growth uh, alongside of going to Economics 101. So it wasn't called Economics 101 then, it was just called Economics 1. Uh, and trying to get my head around uh, 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 concepts which uh, I had to work with for the rest of my degree. And, and having this text alongside of it. Um, and this text never featured at all in this preparation that I had, you know, for three years, it, it wasn't ever referenced. It was like a kind of secret alongside of, uh, uh, you know, what we were doing in the, in, in the classroom. But this book raised this critical question about what we're doing to planet Earth. Uh, and, and, and what uh, the dangers were that uh, we were facing and that we had put ourselves in. Uh, and so it, it remained for the rest of my academic career uh, a kind of warning. I never went back to it, but it was a warning. And of course, it's now come into uh, full volume in the discussion about uh, climate change. Uh, about the climate emergency and where we are uh, around those questions of, 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 of what we're doing to, to the planet. And so Mampella said, why can't we get the very best people in the country around the table to talk about uh, what the situation is? And uh, I had to uh, say to her that we have been trying. Uh, we have been trying over these last few years to get dialogues going around uh, these kinds of questions. Uh, and we've 
to be frank, we've struggled. Uh, we always talk to the same kind of people. Um, and, 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 uh, and so I'm really pleased to see uh, all of you here tonight. The idea is that we should be looking at ways of continuing this conversation. And if, if any of you have any good ideas about how we might do that, uh, and, and not only to the converted, but how we might keep a dialogue going about things that really matter for, for us here. Uh, and you'll hear David making this point in the talk. I hope he, he, he does it. About how so important South Africa is in that conversation in terms of thinking about the future. The future of the globe. Uh, I regularly, when I have opportunity to say that South Africa is one of the, the world's, what I call, ontological hotspots. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's a space where uh, uh, difference and diversity, the good and the bad, come together in ways that you have in very few parts of the world. It's all here. Uh, and we're needing to know how to make this count in our favor in the way in which we talk to the rest of the world. So, so, so are we able to pick up and stimulate and keep this dialogue going is my interest, is what I really am, uh, am, am interested in. And, and so, as I say, if any of you have good ideas about, about that, um, I really would appreciate it. So what we're going to do this evening, um, we'll, we're going to start off with, with, with David, and I'll introduce him in a second. Uh, and immediately after he's done, I want to ask Gavin to speak with us for about 10 minutes or so. Uh, we'll have a short conversation amongst ourselves in the front here, and then throw the floor uh, uh, open uh, for, for all of us. So... First of all, big welcome then to David Corton, and thanks to David uh, for being here. Um, I hope all of you would have read David's um, um, bio, um, but the signature with which David comes and which many people will know, he wrote a book uh, called When Corporations Rule the World. Um, and uh, he has a distinguished career in engaging the business and the corporate community in thinking about uh, what we ought to be doing. <clears throat> um, a story, uh, it's not apocryphal, it's, it's true. He says that the best decision that he made in his life was to leave Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and join the real world. So, um, he, He's made his, his, his world uh, the work of, of being a, a, what I'd like to call a scholar activist. <clears throat> uh, and it's really great to have you here. Thank David. you. Thank you. Um, uh, after David goes, we'll have uh, Gavin Anderson. <clears throat> How many of you know Gavin? <laughs> <clears throat> so, so, I, I really think that's also one of these injustices of, of South Africa. Gavin is the salt of the South African earth. Uh, he he uh, has cut his teeth in innovation, in working out how to uh, uh, sustain uh, corporate activity uh, in, in the most creative kind of way. <clears throat> uh, and he is involved now with an organization called Seriti. Uh, and, and the story of this organization is itself extraordinary. Uh, it's about how he has been able to bring people together uh, to work out how to finish a commitment which they have made. Um, <clears throat> uh, and the Seriti commitment uh, is a really complicated one. Uh, it's about a community trying to pick itself up from the ground and uh, put together their resources and their capacities. Uh, and he struggled and fallen. He has fallen and he's picked them up again and they 
have picked themselves up. And the story which they, they have to, to tell us about how to manage these incredible South African difficulties, these incredible South African difficulties of poverty, inequality, small-mindedness, uh, prejudice, uh, people's sense of self-importance, the power of government and all of that, uh, and to, to, to try and think of a way forward is uh, what for me makes Gavin somebody whom we all ought to know and to hear about. So I'm very pleased to have, 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 have Gavin here. We had also asked, because we had liked to have made this conversation this evening, I'm speaking for longer than I wanted to, um, um, uh, a slightly different one to Cape Town. We had thought that we could bring government in here and we had invited Trudy Mackay uh, from uh, the presidency in the president's office and unfortunately she's out of the country. It would have been really good to have had her here but just to say to all of you we, we, did, we did try. So uh, thanks very much. I'd like to now hand over to, to David. Thank you, David. Thank you. I appreciate that wonderful and warm introduction, and uh, it's interesting here just being behind this podium, which suggests an unusual business school. Um, being totally exposed in front of the. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful, lovely introduction. Oh, okay. Um, one of the things that I find extraordinary about this visit to South Africa is the readiness to have this conversation. And I'm particularly impressed by and grateful to the Graduate School of Business at the University of Cape Town. You know, there's not many universities and or many business schools in the world that would invite me to stand up here in front of some of their most loyal supporters to talk about how what business schools are teaching is leading the human species to self-extinction. Uh, just something most business schools wouldn't do. So the very fact that this school has invited me to give this lecture suggests it's a very special place. And I must say that the conversations I've had here, and not just within the business school, but in general within this university, uh, do confirm that not only is this a very special university, but South Africa is also a very special place in terms of both the, the depth of the issues that you face, but also the recognition of those issues and the readiness to have the conversation. Um, I'm kind of tempted, the, it, it's always interesting, you know, we've had so many interesting conversations and I find as I move from one to the next, they push me deeper and deeper. But one of the things I very often start by sharing with audiences is to note that I'm probably not going to tell you anything tonight that you don't already know. Because the fundamental issues we face are not so esoteric. They really shouldn't require a PhD to understand. And in fact, in some ways, since our academic traditions so narrow our perspective, it may be easier to understand them if you do not have a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and this, of course, is part of one of the handicaps that we all have to, uh, to move beyond, that the issues are systemic. Our educational system and most everything we do in society is so fragmented and we must move beyond that. Um, and I'm kind of inclined, uh, you know, as I was preparing today, I kind of narrowed down to uh, two very, very simple questions that I, I don't usually ask and yet they're 
they're foundational to the discussions we need to have, which which do continuously come back. I mean, the the theme of my um, of my talk is a new economy for a new civilization, and it's all based on the premise that the institutions of our current civilization, as we call it, uh, are leading us to human self-extinction. And some of us consider that that's a bit of a problem that needs serious attention and rapid uh, correction. And if you follow the, uh, the scientific assessments, particularly on climate change, uh, we have absolutely no time to delay. We basically have to get fundamental shifts. Your mic's working again. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have to get fundamental shifts underway within the next year or two. So this is this is no small conversation. But but let me just pose these two questions, which uh, particularly come to mind as sort of begin to get acquainted with uh, um, with, uh, with 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 the layout here in Johannesburg. What would an ideal life, an ideal world, look like in your mind? And this is just a question to, to pose. That would meet the needs of everyone on our finite earth, you know, given our existing population. How would you really like to live in a way that would be consistent with that reality? Kind of what kind of housing, what sort of neighborhood, what kind of relationship with the people that you live near? Uh, would you want to have a bunch of cars and everybody running into traffic jams, or might you have some other view? What, how, how would you like to relate to nature? What would be our global relationships? Would we all be competing for markets? Uh, uh, how do we how are we feeling about war? Is that a good thing or not? Um, just kind of getting that in mind. It's basically one of the fundamental questions we need to be asking as we confront the transition to a new civilization. What would life in that civilization which brings our species back into balance with the living earth in a way that provides a good and decent life for all people, what would that look like? The other question, I was thinking about this, it'd be interesting to take a global poll asking this question. Do you think that organizing society around institutions, for the, the most powerful institutions, um, have as their primary agenda maximizing the financial returns to the already richest people on the planet? Would that arrangement likely lead to the world that you just had in mind that you'd like to live in? I see people shaking no. I think maybe we could stop the conversation right here and open it up for, <laughs> for discussion with the floor. Um, but this is kind of the foundation. Recognizing that we are on a very bad path because of an economic system that is the ultimate failed system based on very bad economic theory that is driving us in exactly the direction that no sane person should want to go. Now, when you talk about organizing conversations, you know, this is an urgent conversation. We need to be having it in every church, every academic institution, every local community forum. Recognizing that it's an emergency, but it is also an extraordinary opportunity. Because where we now must go 
is where most sane people would want to go. Wow. Everybody without a PhD able to understand that? <laughs> Anyhow, um, I'm, I've developed kind of a, a special appreciation for business schools. My own uh, graduate education was the Stanford Business School. I did teach for a time on the Harvard Business School faculty. Uh, most of my business school experience, however, was international. And it was around a cause that business schools don't usually organize around. It was around the question of how can business education contribute to eliminating global poverty? So um, back in the 1960s, Fran and I, my wife here in the front row, um, we went off to Ethiopia and the circumstances were such that we became involved in quite literally setting up the Haile Selassie, well, the, 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 school, great, the School of Business in Haile Selassie One University in Ethiopia. Um, so very much immersed in that. Uh, subsequently, my major role actually at the Harvard Business School was as the last business school, Harvard Business School advisor of the Central American Management Institute in Nicaragua, which was the leading MBA program in Latin America. I think it's, it still is, I believe. Um, and then for a number of years, uh, with support from Rockefeller Foundation, I, was, I w was chief organizer of a group we called the Management Institute's Working Group on Social Development Management which was a group of business schools that included in CHI in Central America, the uh, uh, IESA, which is a major business school in uh, Venezuela, uh, the Asian Institute of Management, the Indi Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad, and the, uh, the, uh, the staff college uh, at Hyderabad. Um, all around the question of how can management education actually be used to strengthen community empowerment, control of their resources to meet their own needs in ways that are in balance with earth and just and so forth. I gradually came to realize that we weren't going to get very far focusing on that end because there were these much larger forces that were underway that were shifting power ever further toward global corporations, corporations increasingly taking over governments so that what we call democracy had less and less meaning because it was really, you know, one, one dollar, one vote, not one person, one vote. Um, and it was also the time that Fran and I were waking up to the reality that much of what we called development, which was funded by the World Bank and the IMF and other official organizations, was really a process of driving people off of the land that they had lived on and that had sustained them and their ancestors for maybe thousands of years pushing them into the paid employment economy so that their lands could be taken over by transnational corporations, either farmed or mined or, or whatever, to grow these profits for the already rich. While the people that had lived off of these lands were being forced into really terrible jobs of infinite servitude, and the development economists were saying, look, we've lifted these people out of absolute poverty. They had no income before. Now they're earning a dollar and a quarter a day. Look what we have accomplished. I have many times wished that I could send those economists out to any place of their choice in the world and say, you've got a dollar and a quarter a day to live on. Show me how you do it. But what we came to realize was that the much larger force in the world was 
the force that was moving us exactly toward pushing more and more people into lives of, of absolute misery, uh, increasing inequality while advancing this environmental destruction. And it may be useful, there, there, there are two statistics that I use to, to sum up the situation. One is the uh, statistic from um, the Global Footprint Network, that as a species now, globally, we humans consume at 1.7 times what Earth can sustain. So we're doing 1.7, everything above one is actually literally destroying Earth's capacity to support life. It's depleting our soils, just depleting Earth's capacity to uh, regenerate our water, maintain the fisheries, all of the things that maintain the stability of the climate, all the things that are essential to our well-being. Then there is on the inequality side, the statistic put out by Oxfam that the world's 27 richest individuals now have financial assets equal to the poorest half of humanity. So you get 27 people here on this hand and then equal assets for 3.9 billion people. And then you got the richest of Jeff Bezos, you can't keep track from one day to the next how many billions he's got, whether it's 150, 140, up and down. Insanity. And of course, coming back again, that the whole, the whole economy is increasingly designed and managed to uh, move in that direction. Y you mentioned your experience with the Club of Rome's Limits to Growth Study. I had a similar, similar experience. Um, I was actually on the Harvard faculty at the time the, the study came out. We were in Nicaragua, but then, then came back up and participated in seminars with the, uh, um, with the MIT group that, that did the study. Um, and we're very struck by it. And a part of, a part of what's important, it, it, this, this, the report and the study simply laid out using computer models, the obvious, that if you have continued growth in human population and consumption on a finite earth, surprise, you will run out of essential resources and you will destroy Earth's capacity to sustain life. Who, who needs a computer model to prove that? But it, it got enormous attention at the time. It sold 30 million copies in 30 languages, one of the most successful books of all times. But you had the whole corporate media and the economists, uh, many of whom I ended up working with at Harvard, and uh, remember their, you know, their just concerted effort to dismiss that Club of Rome study. No limits to growth, we're never going to run out of resources, we can take care of all these, all these environmental problems and so forth. Now, I've been giving considerable attention recently to the question, well, if, if the neoliberal economics with its obsession with GDP growth and its policies that move toward this increasing concentration of corporate power to further grow the fortunes of the already rich, um, what would and economics for the 21st century really look like. And recognizing that you know, economics is, comes from the Greek word koinomia, meaning household management. Well, household currently is Earth, the whole household of humanity. You know, this is another thing our experience has taught us. You know, when we first went off to Ethiopia, you know, our best communication was snail mail. So you move from that to a world in which we can instantly communicate with virtually any human being on Earth uh, with both audio and visual. Um, that's a fundamentally different world. We now live in a world in which we have to think and act as a species. And yet we also have to think and act as living beings. 
And part of what we're beginning to learn, and it's, it's why I'm fascinated with the breakthroughs in the science, the way your scientists in this university are thinking about um, science, uh, is they see, really seem to be in tune with the realities of living systems. When, when I wrote When Corporations Rule the World, which is basically the critique of the concentration of corporate power through international trade agreements and the agreements of the World Trade Organization and other measures that basically are systematically re remove the power and control from community and from democratic governments to shift them to profit-seeking global corporations. And back in the 1990s, we were just beginning to kind of put together a, no a number of global activists, what, what was really going on um, and what the implications were and beginning to develop a global opposition to that. Um, once when corporations rule the world came out, which basically was kind of a summary of the a summation of the uh, the conversations I was having with this extraordinary group of international activists, several of us began to realize that you know it's very important to draw awareness to the causes of the economic failures that we're experiencing. But simply developing resistance against what we don't want is a losing strategy. You have to have a positive alternative. That was one of the things that led Fran and me to start Yes Magazine. But we, you know, on a, on a large global level, it, it set me looking for, well, what would that alternative look like? And that's very foundational now to thinking about a new economics. And I had a feeling, um, I, I didn't know where you'd find the foundation, but I had a feeling that somehow the secret was in living systems. It was in a deeper understanding of how life organizes. But the only biology I knew was the neo-Darwinianism, which is about the survival of the fittest and the strongest and the most competitive and the most violent and so forth. And that just didn't seem to be an answer to our problem. So this is one of these kind of experiences where a very brief encounter can make a huge difference in one's life and thinking. I was at a conference in Spain and this very petite Asian lady, clearly from China, came up to me and said, my name is Dr. Mei Wan Ho. Um, she says, I'm very interested in your work and I think what I'm doing may be useful to you. She says, I am a microbiologist, but I'm a new biologist, not an old biologist. Hmm. <laughs> she didn't look that young, she looked fairly mature. <laughs> Um, so what's a, what's a new biologist? So, well, a, a, a conventional biologist will take a living cell, grind it up, study its chemical composition, and think they've learned something about life. Of course, the process, they've killed it. She says, I take a very different approach. I study living cells and how they constantly manage and exchange water, nutrients, energy and information. Well, that seems kind of sensible, but isn't that interesting? Those are kind of essentials of life and they're managed and you, once you get into it, you begin to realize that life exists only as a consequence of the labor of life, maintaining the anti-anthropic conditions essential to life's existence. This gets a little technical, but the part that's very understandable. She went on and pointed out, she says, take your, take your own body. You know, think about this when you go to bed tonight, if you haven't already been exposed to this. Your body is comprised of literally tens of trillions of individual living decision-making cells. 
and that includes countless microbiomes that are not even part of your 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 whole structure but your very existence depends on them because of the reasons of processing your food and and so forth these these cells you know if you, if you study organization you get this into your mind how the hell would you ever organize this they are all constantly self-organizing in that exchange of energy, nutrients, information, water, to create this, this vessel of your consciousness and the instrument of your agency by which you interact with the world. And yet how many of you have any awareness of these cells organizing on your behalf? Anybody here have any awareness of that? For most of us, it never even occurs to us. And yet they're, they're doing it with each cell somehow recognizing that it has essential functions for the whole. At the same time, it has to serve the whole or it will no longer exist. That its own existence as a living being depends on the outcome of this cooperative effort. So this gets it real right down personal. But then you get into the bigger picture of life. Uh, I mean, on life on the planet. Now, you know, the astronomers now tell us, yeah, there's billions, trillions of solar systems out there and, uh, you know, planets and suns. And an awful lot of planets. Thank you. This is the only one that scientists have identified that we have reason to believe has conditions on the surface essential to the maintenance of life as we know it. Wow, that makes this planet pretty special. And these are exactly the qualities that we are self-organizing to destroy in order to grow the financial accounts of billionaires. And have you ever thought about what money is? You know, it's wealth, it's their means of living and so forth. Of course, if you really thought about it, you realize there's nothing but, you know, maybe a piece of paper with a number on it, but most of the numbers we call money are on a hard drive someplace in some computer that nobody can even see. And so we're in the business, the business, that would be the right term, of destroying the real wealth of creation in order to grow these numbers we can't even see on a computer hard drive. Wow. Um, I think we can probably all agree without a whole lot of discussion that that doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, the few minutes I got left, I want to, I want to run you through quickly eight principles that I've come up with, that I'm kind of working with on this new economics, because they kind of point to the practical implications for things that we need to do in our, um, our thinking, but also our policy and institutions. Principle one is indicators. How do we evaluate economic performance? This is foundational. GDP growth basically measures increases in consumption that go through the market. So it's increases in consumption that involve relationships that are monetized. So you take these people that are drawn out of that village where people all live together and they live to earth and so forth, and they probably had no money, whatever. They didn't need it. They just exchange the things that they needed to exchange and they all live together. Now we've monetized those relationships. And if you look around and look at all the ways our relationships are monetized, you look at the number of people in places like the United States, I don't know, maybe here in South Africa also, um, you know, we're increasingly getting toward 50% of people in the United States live in single, single person households. There's no other person in the household. They live alone. Hmm. You know, and then many are working two or three jobs. You're getting off in a car. You're getting on some, um, some anonymous uh, exchange move around, move around town. 
and basically with no real relationships with another human being or with Earth. That leads to all kinds of psychotic breakdown and suicides. We need to be measuring our economic performance by measures of well-being of Earth and people. And those would probably be non-financial indicators. Okay, principle two, resources. We gotta use our available resources for things that are truly beneficial. You know, we're consuming 1.7 times what Earth can sustain. Well, is this gonna be a big, a big sacrifice if we reduce that consumption? Well, it could be, but if we focused on eliminating war, eliminating our dependence on cars, eliminating planned obsolescence, we could begin to put together a very long list of things that we could very well do without and be better off in the process. So this is the kind of thinking that we need to be bringing in and, um, and you know, organizing our indicators around. Then there's a question of ownership. If you really begin to get into life, you find, as I mentioned before, that life exists only as a consequence of life's labor. Life depends on labor, and it might follow that the reward should go to those who provide useful labor. It's not just nature and the cells in our body that provide the labor, but any of nature's products that we're going to use in a way that will be helpful to us require human labor. And we should all be gainfully employed, not necessarily in paid employment, but in the kind of work of converting, of creating those things that are essential to our individual and community well-being. And the ownership should be organized accordingly. This would all lead to the elimination of transnational corporations and other forms of unaccountable absentee ownership. Money. Money is actually a useful tool if we recognize it's just a useful tool for exchange. But it should be created not by private banks and financial markets that are using it again to uh, create inflated assets to increase the power of the people who play financial games. Um, it needs to be a totally public, transparent function. And with no illusions that you're creating any wealth when you're creating money, you are just simply creating a means of facilitating useful exchange. We could spend hours discussing the implications. Um, principle five is education. Most of our education is geared to teaching people skills to succeed in the system as it exists. If you begin to think about the changes that are going to be required if we're going to have a human future, we have to create a world that no human being has ever experienced. And nobody knows how to get there. A lot of us have got ideas, and to get there, we're going to have to work together. But it suggests a very different kind of education, which is focused on learning from real world engagement. Technology. We can no longer afford to put our emphasis on technologies that maximize profits for those who control the technology. We need to focus on technologies that will actually be useful and helpful to people on Earth and helping us meet all our needs. Principle seven is community. Um, we basically have a fundamental choice. We can either make our primary unit of organization transnational corporations, or we can make it living communities of place, organized essentially as bioregions that are fundamentally self-reliant in, uh, in the management and exchange of their resources to meet their own needs. And of course, interlinked in ways that are in balance. We have made the choice of the corporations and the financial markets. It is absolutely the wrong choice. We have to focus on restoring community and community control. Uh, principle eight is population. Uh, 
growing human population means we've got more and more people to try to maintain with the existing earth resources and we've got to bring that into balance by providing more opportunities for women, providing free access to fertility management methods and uh, facilitating voluntary uh, readjustments between overpopulated and underpopulated areas. So anyhow, these are, this will give you a few of the ideas. I mean, it's, it's why some of us say we need to talk in terms of a new civilization, because obviously these changes are not marginal adjustments. They are deep and fundamental adjustments, and we've got to get on with achieving them soon. I think business schools have an extraordinary uh, place in that. And I also think South Africa may be a place where a lot of this could be initiated for two reasons. One, you've got a huge problem and you recognize it. You know you're now they're the most unequal country in the world. Um, but also, the thing that fascinates me is that you have people here from these extraordinary traditional cultural communities that lived in harmony with one another and Earth without any of the modern institutions that we consider essential to our organization. You know, no formal governments, no, uh, no corporations, and no money. Um, there are, you know, this is not about going back to living as those people lived uh, many years ago, but it is about learning from their experience and incorporating that into our thinking along with all the other lessons from all the other aspects of our experience. So I will close with that and uh, look forward to uh, your comments and to the further conversation.